Hey everyone, welcome to the Lake Michigan Angler Podcast. Today we are here with Captain Blake Kuhn of Storm Force Charters and Captain Caleb Weiner of The Migrator. Welcome guys. And today we're going to talk about salmon fishing. <laughs> when, when, are we not talking about, when are we not talking about salmon fishing? I like how you added that there. Uh, welcome back. You guys are no strangers to the, uh, strangers to the podcast. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we actually, we're going to be honest here. We have no script or like no, Rob and I were like, what are we going to talk about? We're like, mm. uh, so we're freestyling today, which should be interesting because I guess we can kind of just kind of go wherever the conversation leads us. Um, one cool thing we did ask both the captains to do was to go into the shop and grab, uh, to go grab five things that are essential for you um, on your fishing trips, on, on your charters, and so on and so forth. And I think we're going to open up with that and kind of go through and dig in uh, what are the five things they, they each picked and kind of explaining uh, why they chose it and how it plays a part into what they're doing on their trips um, on a daily basis. So, uh, Caleb, we'll start with you. You want to go through your little five uh, various uh, items you pulled from the shop? Yeah, so... Um I just kind of grabbed a handful of moonshines, a uh, RV Blue Flounder, a uh, RV Bloody Nose, an RV Moonshine Wonder Bread, all gray spoons for multiple species. Um, just kind of, you know, a, a quick look at, you know, some of the basics I grab kind of daily from kind of the tail end of the coho season all the way through the fall, trying to catch three-year-old kings, all that. You know, in the springtime, I grabbed a little red dodger. A lot of people come into the shop when I'm here or... You know, they talk to me about coho fishing, and they're like, oh, well, I got this, and I got that, and I got this, and I got that. I'm like, buy, like, 20 of these and call it a day. <laughs> like, once the cohos get bigger, buy some stubbies. Otherwise, like, everybody overcomplicates it. You know, you walk down a charter dock in April, May, early June, and every charter boat's got 17 of yeah. these rigged up. It's not, you know, everybody kind of overcomplicates it a lot. And then I grabbed a 11-inch uh, chrome e-chip that uh, it's just an you know, 90% of the time is always a producer down on the bottom when you're summertime fishing, fall fishing. You know, it catches kings. It catches a lot of lake trout. You know, last year caught our biggest king on the boat. You know, I run a spinning glow behind it most of the time with a tail. But, you know, you come in in the morning or the fall or uh, in the morning or the evening and you're fishing the hill or whatever, you throw a full fly behind it. And it's fantastic for kings. I've caught cohos down there on it. It's just kind of all around great bait to have in the water all the time. And I've talked about it in a lot of the other seminars and podcasts, you know, a big 11 inch paddle on the bottom. It just kind of, it's all by itself, makes a big flash and it's usually a really great producer. Is that primarily uh, for your Laker setup? It is. I mean, I'm putting it down there for Lake Trout, but at the same time, you know, you know, you know, midday negative Kings on the bottom or whatever, they'll hit it too. You know, I've can't tell you how many times midsummer you're fishing and you're catching mostly Lake Trout and, it pops twice in a row and you pull it up and the hook's all twisted and everything. And you're like, oh, well, there's cohos down there too. And a lot of times you can't get tension on them fast enough to, to get them in, but you know they're down there and it's, you know, everybody thinks, oh, it's a lake trout rig, it's a lake trout rig. But I mean, I've ran it on the hill with a full bullfrog or mirage or super frog or whatever down there and it produces for kings and everything on the inside too. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about on, on, your, on, the, on the Dodger here, um, obviously the double O's have been used for a while now, a lot of years. Um, it's a staple, uh, stubbies have been around now and become like more of a recent thing in our area, uh, for a while. It was kind of like a, uh, I guess like a secret, if you will, yep. to, the, to the extent that like it was like a local area guy thing guys here and charters knew about it and were using it. Um, I, I, th I think we get a lot of people when they come to the shop and they'll ask Rob and I, you know, especially if they're newer, um, why would I go with a double O? Why would I go with a stubby? When's the right time for one or the other? Is there any kind of uh, method to the madness that you can shine some light on in terms of differentiating or when to use either one? Um, so I started using stubbies actually um, years ago when I was a first mate with Captain Bob Rosa on the Migrator. And he would come in and tell uh, Frank Jesuit before he passed all about stubbies and how great they were and best thing since sliced bread. And everybody used to say, oh, all you need is a double O, all you need is a double O. And I, you know, I still agree with that statement, like you can survive off a double O. But there was days when we would fish with, you know, all double O's and then one stubby in the spread of everything, and that stubby would outproduce everything on the boat. And I think it's just because it was something a little different. It's got a little different wobble to it, a little different um, movement to it, and the fish are seeing all, you know, and I think you could probably put something else in this place too sometimes, and it would do the same purpose. But I also think it's a little bigger of a dodger, so once the cohos start, you know, getting bigger, they're, you know, 
four or five pounds, I think the stubby really produces better and they like the action of it, especially come summertime when we were fishing offshore. I mean, we were using stubbies this year in July, early August for those bigger cohos, you know, on a downrigger close to the ball, they would produce for um, the bigger cohos. And I know Blake runs them on all his coppers all the time. It's so aggravating listening to him talk on the radio. Oh, yeah, stubby on a co 300 coppers smoking them today. No, it's terrible. I don't do that. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because we did that video with you last year, and uh, it was a great trip for Rob and I to, to watch your whole setup. And, and because there are things you do that seem to be a little more conventional from, from what the majority of folks are doing, and uh, one of those was running the uh, stubbies. Uh, what was it the prism, the red prism, and there was like the yellow prism one, or, or um, there were UV. I mean, the, yeah, there were a bunch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were there were a variety of them. But um, but that video, you know, here's a little backstory behind that video. We went out that day, and what was our original kind of theme we were trying to shoot for that video? You remember? Do you remember what we thought initially about shooting? A premise because when we go out for these shoots with the captains we try to come up with like a little something specific now obviously on the water if say we we're going to go out and do a lake trout video if they're not cooperating well we got to call audible and we got to figure out something else and change the what the content for that video is supposed to be about and that was something with you we were going to do i think we we're going to do like old school versus new school lures yeah and then uh and then it wasn't cooperating so no kind of switched it up switched it up and then uh you started dunking the uh stubbies on there and rob and i like okay this is gonna be interesting and then it was just like pulling I mean, the dragon slayers off and putting the stubbies yeah, out yeah we, had, <laughs> we went 20 minutes without catching a the fish there are already five stubbies in the water and blake's like let's put another stubby down you know what's funny <laughs> I don't, we never said this before, but when you pulled off the Dragon Slayer, the look on Rob's eyes, I saw the dismay and shock in his eyes because he doesn't say much, but I just, I, working with him long enough, I, I can read his eyes. And Rob was like, he really pulled that off right now. Like, Rob was like, this is not good. I'm sure he thought we weren't going to get any fish or any video footage. And then it just started firing off. And, and uh, um, I say all to say, I say all that to say, though, to speak to Caleb's point, which is, those things, uh, I think, after that video, found life in the summer because a lot of people just tend to use them in the spring, mm -hmm. and um, you guys are pulling them in the summer with great success. So it's, I think it's definitely opened up uh, eye, uh, people's eyes into the versatility of that that Dodger. You know, because I don't think you do any of you run the double O's in the summer once in August, like. Seven years ago, we had a right. big coho run in like 260, and we all had little red dodgers out again for like three days, but otherwise, no. So so, so I guess the argument there, um, when someone's choosing between the two, you might get more bang for your buck in terms of, I can buy the stubby, I can use it spring, and I can go into the summertime with it and still you know, get extended life out of it versus the double O, which should be in your arsenal. I mean, let's not... Yeah. And, I, and I think also, like, and you can correct me, but, like, in April fishing, and I would say early May, I would say a double O usually outperforms out a stubby early on. I would say there's days it does, but I run them start as soon as I start. You run them until you're, you're dead. So, <laughs> I, so what, one thing I can say about Blake and his stubbies, we had a three-boater last year. We were fishing pretty far offshore, and it was me, Blake, and his dad, and his dad went off to – the depths and Blake and I just kind of fished in a circle next to each other <laughs> and we talked the whole time and we both caught like the exact same amount of fish and our spreads could not have been more different. <laughs> I mean, Blake's got stubbies on coppers and leads and all sorts of things and I'm pulling spoons and the only thing the same was our bottom rod. Uh, yep. But like it just, you know, we fish, you know, pretty differently. So there's yeah. always a multiple ways of doing things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that, that was a real testament to that because you're in the same area. You're, still, you're pulling fish in there. So, uh, at what that just speaks to if you're pulling your stuff right, the right angles. Yeah, the right I speeds mean, and... Blake, you know, trolls so much slower than most of us a lot of the time. So I mean, that's probably one reason his stubbies and steel dodgers work so much better. You know, compared to you know, I would say the majority of fishermen in the summer are running on leads and coppers are running spoons. Where you know they have much more speed tolerant. Where Blake, you know, half the time you go past him, you don't think he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> so. Call the coast guard. I think his boat's not working. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, to go back to the uh, to the moonshines here, is there any question or any argument that Bloody Nose was not the, just at least for our area the color of last year? I, mean, I didn't catch any fish on it. I didn't either. I really? <laughs> I think I caught two on it. I, well, okay. Take away 
Rob, take away the fact that you didn't catch any, but from a sales point. Well, I sold a lot of them. A lot. For sure. Like, that was the one that people were constantly coming to. Any more bloody nose? Any more bloody nose? Did, did you uh, experience so that? I, right? I actually really, until this past year, have not been a big fan of that spoon. Okay. Um, <laughs> and this year it was a great provider for us. So, I mean, I, you know, I went from having one or two in my box, and now I've got you know, <laughs> six of each size and all, all that crap going on. But, I mean... It's, but this is one of those things, like, a cup, you know, every year there's that hot spoon, and, you know. Yeah, that's next, what I'm saying. And the next year you can't catch a stupid fish on it. So I hate yeah. to, you know, always promote, you know, what was good this year. But, you know, like, the, that's why I have the other two here. They've been, you know, producers for me for years, yes. year yeah. in, year out. You know, some years the Wonder Bread's just absolutely a stud, but it's never a dud. Right. It always you know, catches it, fish. It always provides. If yeah. You, when in doubt, put it out. Yeah. And, and you know, when I, when I talked about this, someone had left a comment on, like, one of my YouTube videos and was like, well... Could it just be the fact that because people talked about it so much, then more people were running it, which then, you know, then you, it's like the whole math thing, right? There's more people fishing it, which means there's the more opportunities for that lure to catch fish, right? On a numbers basis. I was like, it's an interesting thought, but uh, we sold a lot. There was, there was just no doubt about it. That, that spoon color uh, from Moonshine last year was, was definitely popular. And it, it's going to be interesting to see how this year, does it hold? Do we still see... Uh, people still coming in highly uh, requesting the uh, bloody nose, or is there another spoon that kind of comes out and and uh, takes the lead, I guess, for the year? Um, Blake, let's go through your selection of uh, of kind of like your essentials, your go tos. What do you have here for us? Uh, we'll start with the mini moonshine. Uh, we ran this during the video, and it was really good. I think we caught rainbows, lake trout, and I think we caught a king on it. If I remember, yeah, I right. think yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, this I started running it last year because my first mate recommended it and it worked really good so might be something you want to add so you're running it on on coppers coppers yep a 200 copper so relatively high yep compared to the rest of your setup okay right it says one board without a stubby on it <laughs> <laughs> i think that is true for the video. <laughs> <laughs> probably yeah and then uh i got a pack of bullfrogs this is probably the highest producing fly in my opinion i would agree i'm not sure if you guys agree yeah i mean it's a staple um, mm-hmm I probably never go out without having at least one of these in my spread, I would say. It's a good producer. I even run it behind stubbies, so. <laughs> full, full length? Uh, or you'll cut them? I'll cut them in half. Okay. okay. And then, of course, a stubby. Um, I pretty much run these up until October when we're lake trout fishing. Um, they always produce every trip. I mean, there's times, you know, you catch one fish on them. But most of the time, I'm catching, you know, three to five fish on them every trip. Um this one was really good for me for like a week. I just grabbed it. <laughs> um, you want to give it to the people that week so they can put it on their calendar so they know yeah. to run that one? I think it was like mid-July. Okay, we were mid-July. Fishing the hill. Um, no, but I did catch a lot of fish on it in that week, so I chose it because it's something I never really ran before, and it ended up working for me, so maybe try it. And I'm surprised course, you didn't have the white pro troll up here. The white pro- oh, the white e-chip? Yeah. <laughs> forgot about that one and then like caleb said the paddle um i run this probably starting mid-june for the rest of the year it never comes off the rod that's just your center shoot yep all the the time uh you know i'll switch it up i'll put a frog behind it with like a 42 inch leader and then i'll put a spinning goal behind it it just kind of depends on the day got you so that's interchangeable whether you're looking for a king or for a lake or you're just switch the yeah, fly or the spinning glow if i'm catching a lot of lake trout on the spinning glow i'll try to switch it to the fly and try to catch salmon and lake trout you know you won't catch as many lake trout but you can get some salmon mixed in a little steadier you know i always thought to myself what is it about the spinning glows uh that the lakers tend to favor over say just a fly that was down in the same depth that you're fishing right any thought on to what that is you know I, I can't say what it is that they, they prefer about it. It's just been, you know, I don't know if it's the little extra activity that, that spin in the water, okay. you know, probably makes a tiny bit of noise down there and just more flash to it. I mean, it's just, you know, it's what we were taught from all the guys we first made <laughs> just it for, do it. all the old timers, like, you know, you know, lake trout fishing has come, I would say, a, a pretty far in the last, you know, 10 years just because of the lack of kings in the lake, you know, for a while. And, you know, when I first started, it was – just put old mo chrome dodger white tail green spin and go on the bottom and you'll catch all that, that that'll, that'll work now you know i feel like we've perfected it just because we had to and you know it's still a spinning glow but it's you know with big paddles or plastic and we still run dodgers in the fall especially on the reefs and stuff but it's just something about it that 
They just it, like it. Just always outperforms a fly on the bottom. I mean, I mean that being said, I mean I'll run flies behind this just like he will, you know, and we'll catch you know kings on it. But at the same time, you're gonna outperform the fly with a spinning glow. Yeah, that's that's also pretty interesting. Um, and then Blake, going back to the stubby here, um, could you share for anyone that's looking to try and uh, to to utilize them um, in the summertime? kind of like how you're running them you're, you're running off your coppers off boards and stuff or yeah i would say majority of the time i'm running them on like a 200 copper sometimes a 300 copper but mainly a 200 and then just like a two inch slider fly behind it with an 18 inch lead okay if i run it on my downriggers in the summer i'll put a four inch hobby behind it but that's pretty much it and you are also running if you do run off the rigger it's tight yeah it's what was it like Three, four feet. Yeah, no, well, like that. No, it wasn't even that. Like, <laughs> here's his. Here's how he did it. Right, he grabbed it, he pitched it into the water, <laughs> six, seven feet back, and then just clipped it on and shot it down. So, I mean, there was, it was just a f- flick it back and, and then put <laughs> clip it onto your to your rigger. Um, and then speed wise, right? Because Caleb did say you you tend to go a little bit slower. Can you can you uh, speak on that? Which what's your normal speeds that you're you're running to be able to pull these properly? Uh, usually every morning I try to start at like one seven, one eight. You know, everybody else starts at like two two. I would say is like the most common number. Yeah. But I always start slow, and just I want to catch every fish I pass. You know, and not not leave any behind. Greedy. <laughs> <laughs> so greedy. You know, most guys will troll faster because they want to cover more ground, more right, water. Right. And, but I don't know. I try to catch every fish I can. Yeah. You definitely try to milk the entire area, I see. <laughs> so so one thing about that is that, that comes back to networking, you know, which I know different guys have talked about in these podcasts, but you know, knowing who you're talking to is a huge help. Right. Like I'll be fishing next to Blake and I'll be over there thinking that I am just the biggest idiot on the planet, not catching any fish or whatever. And I'll look over at Blake and I'll just watch his net, net dip down in the water. And then I'll watch it dip down in the water again. And then I'll slow down. Because I'm trolling past him, and I'm like, oh, okay. And I'll slow down, and all of a sudden, it's like magic. Uh-huh. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that's, you know, they wanted it slower today, or vice versa, or whatever. You know, it's, it's you know, everybody talks about networking, and it's not just about, all about the lure and everything. You know, the, the speed and the is huge. You know, if, you know, Blake's catching fish, and I'm not, or I'm catching fish, and Blake's not, you know, he knows I troll faster than him on average. Right. He knows he trolls slow. It's not like a new thing for him. So if it's not working for, you know, that person, you know, it's for the recreational guys that are always talking to other people, you know, it's a lot of time the question is what lure, what lure, what lure. And as I tested, you know, we and Blake have fished together multiple times right next to each other and ran totally different spreads. It's just knowing the way you fish and how you need to approach it. Approach it. Yeah, no, definitely. Just to touch on this guy again, because I was really impressed. I think both Rob and I were really impressed when you are this thing, this little guy was getting crushed. Um, it wasn't this exact color, but it's the profile. I think it was right, important. Right. Was that small profile on the uh, the, the little spoon? Um, can you touch on? You mentioned that your first mate pitched you the idea. Um, what made you go with it? Uh, were you skeptical? Kind of uh, the whole process. I was a little skeptical, but once he kind of explained it to me, it made sense. A lot of the bait we were seeing in the fish was smaller. You know, three inches, three four inches. So. He's like, let's try to do a smaller profile because we weren't really catching anything on regular sized moonshines or mag moonshines. So he swapped it with that, and it just to go. ever since then it was unbelievable. Yeah, it really speaks to the whole idea that uh, these fish can be keyed on on profile. Like right? they're feeding, like you said, they're they're on those three inches, and they that's kind of like what they just want to go after. So right. that that was really cool. And 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 again, we've seen a lot more of these guys start to take off off the shelves after that mm-hmm. video because it's. It's always cool. I think that's something about this kind of fishing, which is um, we kind of have like our standard, you know, go tos and stuff like that. And I think people are always looking for something to kind of add into the mix to uh, come through on those days that might be a little bit tough where the normal stuff is not just working uh, the way you would want it to. And you pull out that one thing and it's like just kind of taking off for you and all of that. Um, I have a question for Blake, if you don't mind. No, please. So on your mini moonshine there, I ran them with the same year we were fishing with Little Reds way out deep. There was those, you know, little co- those cohos out deep, and we were running Dodgers and stuff. And I ran a few of those, and I liked them. Do you leave the original hook on there? That's the one thing that bothers me. I feel like it's just a tiny hook. So I could, you, could, I got it down to a science. You can catch two fish on it before you have to change the hook. Oh, okay. after that, it's done. <laughs> it's mangled. <laughs> so what hook do you put on it? I just put uh, what is it? Um, 
the coho hook, I think it's size four. Okay, so it's a little bigger than the than, than yep. on there. And, and you think the action's the same still? It doesn't bother it? And I don't think so. Well, okay. you guys seen it. It's like my spoon's like this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, it's it, all bent. And... Yeah, the spoon had literally, uh, the, the, the paint was chipped off it. So it was like uh, the actual silver plating mixed into the paint that was there. So it, it's got a lot of use out of it. Yeah. For sure. Caleb, you, you mentioned about uh, networking and all that stuff. Uh, you know, for, for guys getting out there, where do they start? How do they start getting into some sort of a network on there, uh, out out there? Because it can be very daunting for someone new to get, go out, and you're it's literally trying to you know uh, find a needle in the hay, haystack in terms of where these fish are at to start fishing for them. Um, any tips for folks to to uh, get their network game up? So I mean, there's there's so many. So much information out there now. It's it's you know even me. I see myself reading posts and stuff about it. I mean one of them is that Winthrop Harbor Waukegan salmon report page. If you're fishing in our area, that's huge. I mean you got some great fishermen on there. You know I know you know uh, Jerry Post and John Munda Post. A bunch of great fishermen post on there for the guy who's only going out here and there. There's always good information on there down to direction, speed, lures, depth, everything. You know if you're looking for, you know there's other reports around the lake for that. Um, Salmon becoming an SU member would be huge just to be part of that group. You know, there's so many guys fishing in it. You know, and I always, you know, I, I, t I tell a lot of guys, join SU, fish the club derbies. It's not about the winning, you know, there's no, not, not, not much money in it or anything, but just listening. No. <laughs> <laughs> but just listening at the end of those club derbies and listening to the guys that did well and everything is huge. You'll learn so much and you'll meet people. You'll go on their boat. They'll go and you'll just, just getting that community it's huge. I mean, even for us who do it every day, you know, if I'm gone for three days and, you know, I'm on vacation or something, I come back. I mean, you better know that I, I make about seven phone calls before <laughs> my boat gets started in the morning. You know, I'm, I want to know exactly what's been going on, you know, especially if you don't have, you know, like, you know, probes and things to like kind of check that out. Like I don't run a probe, but I also have a huge network of, you know, great fishermen I talk to. And I'm really, you know, lucky to have that. Um, you can, you know, you can come into the shop and, you know, Rob's usually got a pretty good idea what's going on. He's talking to us, you know, one of us is in here almost every day throughout the week between all the captains and, um, but I would say the clubs and Facebook are huge right now. And once you get into that, you'll start getting like your little niche group where you can talk to people and, and it's just, you know, the way, the way to do it. Yeah. Especially if you're not fishing, you know, multiple days a week. Yeah. That, I mean, that's the hard part because if you're just being, if you're only able to fish on the weekend, there's so much going on during that week between the weather patterns and uh, time of the year that can dictate whether those fish are still in the area. Did they come in? Did they go out? Did they just completely leave the area? And so um, it could save you from burning fuel one day if you're going out there and these fish are way north of us at that point. You're just kind of sitting around, putzing around. And, it, like, it can save you an entire re-rigging of a spread. I mean, there's, I mean, how many times have, you know, we go out on a Saturday and by Friday we've gone from you know, a complete coho spread of yellow birds and high divers and everything to all of a sudden we've got mag divers, a few leads in the water because the water's just turned over like that. Right. And now, you, you know, you got to fish, you know, everything's down 40 to 60 feet now. I mean, it can just turn so fast. And having that network of knowing that, like, you know, hey, it was out last Friday, you know, the yellow birds were smacking, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, no, we're running, <laughs> you know, mag wires and 300 coppers to catch these fish now. So the network is, is really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Blake, let me ask you your thoughts on uh, how, how do you think this year is going to turn out fishing wise uh, for us? Um, especially uh, when you think about last year, what do you, what are your expectations? What are your predictions? I'm thinking it's going to be better than last year. Okay. I think um, just, it seems like we're kind of in the same weather pattern and last year was pretty good. I mean, I can't complain. I think probably, I think I averaged like 13 fish a trip or something like that. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be, I think the coho season is going to be really good, but I think it's going to start early because the warm, you know, it's, the weather's been a little moderate compared to. We talked about that too. Yeah. We haven't had a horrendous, uh, uh, winter. We had just a few, like we're just kind of getting over another cold run, but, uh, and, and a lot of these harbors have been open for a while. They would freeze a little bit, but then they wouldn't stay frozen for a while. So, uh, you're right. It, it's been pretty similar. And then last year, I mean, I distinctly remember being out in Indiana early in March, fished it, and then 
beginning of April, I think, I was back up here. Like, those fish shot past Chicago. Right. And we're already back up in our area, like Waukegan North, and you are able to go right out there, fish in front of the beaches. And I was like, oh, it's great, you know? So, like, last year, we had some tremendous coho. I mean, it was a phenomenal yeah. year for coho, um, size and everything. Do we see this spring start off with the small cookie cutters, or do we do we see the big guys again? Uh. I think every year pretty much starts out with the small cookie cutters, I would say. Um, but I think our average size is going to be bigger, in my opinion. Yeah. I think I think if we get like an average five five pounds early on, that's going to be – I think we see another run of like just really good coho. That's, that was – it really blew my mind. Did, did – uh, at what point for you, Caleb, did you like – this is like the year of the coho. At what point did you start to see like this is different? So I ran my first charter last year. I think it was April 2nd. Uh -huh. And they were little tiny cohos. Right. They were like what you would see. They were like one to two and a half pounds. And it was like just skipping along on the surface when you really miss. Good eaters, yeah. And then like, I don't know. I didn't, ran, I didn't run a lot in early April. But like two, three weeks later, I went out. And they were all like nice, chunky, like, yes. you know, two and a half to three and a half pound cohos. You know, usually what you see in mid-bay, I'm like, ooh, this is good. And I'm like, they're going to be nice. If these fish, you know... I, I think they just, you know, their metabolism kicked in and they were like eating and, you know, they, you know, they were growing quick by June. We were catching some really nice fish and then kind of throughout the summer when they popped back up, you know, they were just massive and a handful to get to the boat. <laughs> but, you know, you know, once you see that kind of that, that, I saw that click of, you know, oh, these are just a normal year of cohos and all of a sudden like three, two or three weeks later, I'm catching dang near, not double the size, but, you know, substantially bigger fish i was like this is you know something special no i i distinctly it's it's funny you say that i distinctly remember the same situation right I'm, i started indiana cookie cutter 18 whatever maybe 20 inches great eaters um and then i remember they blew by chicago so i started fishing up here and like that first one or two trips for myself same kind of thing cookie cutter size mm -hmm. and then i distinctly remember a week or so after the fact i go back out now it's like three four five pounds I'm like, okay, these are these are a bigger size of fish, and then and from there it just kind of took off. And I'm like, wow, this is really crazy. And then I caught my biggest at 14 something. So really, really, uh, really good year. What about kings? Obviously, they're they're in demand. Uh, they are what people covet the most or try to target the most. What do you, we saw an okay year? I think is how I'd word it. It was okay. They weren't. Uh, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. What are we thinking for Kings this year? More of the same, or I, I think it'll be very similar to last year. And 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 you know there are some some places where there's some been you know better King stocking the last few years, and there seems to be more in the lake. Um, I, I think that it's becoming more. You know, it's it's hard for us to gauge because a lot of days we can't fish the hill or whatever because we have you know a group that wants to catch big numbers of fish, and where we can go probably knock out a handful of Kings, but then we have you know five miles between us and where the other better number fishing is. Right. Um, but I, I think it'll be very similar to last year. I think we'll have, it'll be a solid year for it. I don't think we're going to quite see the as big as fish as we saw a couple of years ago, but I think the numbers will be okay. I mean, we caught, you know, Kings, the two and three year olds in the fall, lake trout fishing, you know, by accident. Yep. And there was a, you know, when you're only running three rods, or four rods lake trout fishing in the fall, grinding the bottom, and you still catch a few kings here and there, you think to yourself, man, what if I could really target this productively? What would what would it look like? So Do you ever have you don't do you ever have trips where clients are like, hey, we just want to go out for kings and, and that's kind of mm -hmm. it? Yeah. yeah. Yep. I mean, for sure. And and then at that point, does your strategy change in terms of what you're running? Are you running the full spread or are you just focused on a couple of lines? So I, I will focus on less rods, okay. um, especially if I'm fishing inside of 100 feet of water, just to keep it a little lighter. Um, that that also comes from a lot of networking. Like I know I talked to Rob and um, you guys when you guys fish on Phil's boat, because um, you guys are usually fishing that shallower water, and a lot of times you guys are only running four, five, six rods, and that that makes a big difference for the king fishing, I think. And that's that's what I'll do if I'm I'm really have a group that really doesn't care about any amount of numbers. They just would rather catch one or two big kings and you call it a day yeah do, do you do you find the pressure to be different when um 
you have someone that or clients that say, "Hey, I want to just focus on Kings versus a group that's just like, "Hey, we just want to put numbers on the on on the uh, numbers in the cooler." Is there a different type of pressure, or is it all the same? Definitely different because mm-hmm. there's days you don't know if you're gonna catch a king. Okay. You right. know? <laughs> I mean, they move so much. It's it's you know. There's been days we go out in the evening and, you know, fun fishing with some buddies or something and you'll catch, you know, a handful of nice kings and you're just messing around. You're not even like putting in full effort. Right, you're like, this yeah. is great. I'm going to go out there in the morning and basically <laughs> fish out and there's not a king for 10 miles. Like you're like, oh, oh well, that was that was short lived. Yeah. Well, what, what is it? Uh, why do you think we had such a uh, the king year that we did um, in terms of they were around, but it wasn't like we had a ton of big kings we didn't. We certainly didn't have like big wave or, and just big numbers or, or and big size more importantly any any thought to that it seemed like we saw a lot of them up north you know a lot a lot on the other side of the, of the lake maybe something might have changed in our area maybe i'm not too sure yeah. um it's because it seemed like we had like a slow feed of them it, yeah. they just they weren't all there at once but we had pretty consistent showings of them if that makes sense yeah no i i, I get what you're saying a lot of, lot of two and three year olds i mean in my mind, it's all about the stocking. I mean, Waukegan, they stock some, but they don't stock them the way they should stock them. They just dump them in the lake. Um, they don't stock any in North Point, so we're not going to get a return in North Point. You know, Kenosha, they stock, you know, a good number. But, again, I mean, even lake-wide, I mean, we've had an increased king stocking in the last five, four years. It's, it's gone up since mm-hmm. the big drop. But still, the numbers that are put in the lake – are still far less than it was 15 years ago. And the numbers, you know, like three years ago when we had that year of a ton of big ones around, the number is higher than that now. So, you know, probably going to have smaller fish. You know, it's there is still big fish up north, but, you know, I, I just don't think there's quite as – there's more fish in the lake, so there's yeah, yeah, no, you know, so more competition, for right, the food. right. That's the idea, right? If there's more fish, they're gonna kind of there's gonna be a cap at, at the size because mm-hmm. there's only so much bait. Even though, like, I mean, tons we all bait. we all saw the bait. There's tons of bait, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's gonna be interesting because remember, Michigan is now kind of uh, circling back on what they did. I mean, a couple of years ago, they they pulled back their their stocking number significantly, mm-hmm. like a lot, um, and then. This year, they've said, you know what? We're going to put more back in there. Like, we're going to dump a couple million in here or whatever the numbers are. It's going to be pretty significant. So that's going to be interesting to see in the next four or five years what the average size of those kings be. Because now, now we're talking about, I mean, mm-hmm. Wisconsin's dumping millions and hundreds of thousands. Now Michigan's going to get back on par and dumping hundreds of, million, or hundreds of thousands or millions or whatever it may be uh, to see what the size of these fish are going to be in the you know, next five years. Uh, at least that's something I think about. And uh, but overall, them adding back into the pool of fish, uh, net positive. Oh, for sure, for sure. I think there's still going to be big fish. I mean, there's mm-hmm. been stocking increases, but not enough to really, really decimate the bait fish population to where they're all going to shrink down no, to where they I mean, used there's... to be. There, we might not see quite as many 30s as we did the last few years, but yeah. they're still going to be around. Yeah, and I, th- I think. I mean, obviously, it might be a little bit different for you guys because you guys are are running charters, and it is a numbers game for you guys. And I think the numbers are good, right? They're adding more. It means there's always going to be numbers of fish. But uh, are are you guys of the mindset, if personally fishing now, are you of the mindset that you would rather go out on a trip and catch multiple fish or go out on a trip and catch the biggest fish? Uh, I like, like, a nice nice mixed bag. You know, like three, four big fish and then some numbers mixed in there. Mm -hmm. Kind of keep the day going nicely. Right. Same for you? Yeah, I would agree. I, I mean, I like, I mean, I, don't, I have no interest sitting on a boat for six hours and catch one fish. <laughs> I, just, I just have zero interest. I don't care if that fish is really big. I want to be, you know, active. Doing something. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll gladly go out and catch a handful of smaller fish just, and then, you know, maybe catch one big one. And that's, that's you know, kind of makes the trip. Yeah. Rob? So, I don't like to compromise. I just like to catch a lot of really big fish. Yeah. <laughs> just limit out on 30-pounders. And... Yeah. No, he's not even well, joking. Like, like, Rob's not even joking. Though. Blake, like, Blake guarantees limits of 30-pounders. <laughs> Rob is not even joking. Like, if, if, we, if we go out and it's just, like, small fish, he's like, this is a waste. <laughs> <laughs> what a big fish. But, uh, but, no, that is the cool thing about when we do go out, like, on Phil's boat, which is um, 
we get to go big or go home. And a lot of times yeah. that's how we fish it. Like it's we're setting up the kings, the divers for flasher flies, the, the riggers, and it's pretty much all king spread. And it's like either they're gonna hit, we're gonna get a couple, or we're gonna go just uh it's gonna be a short well go for a boat ride. Well no, <laughs> it is a boat ride because all the trips are short, like it's two hour tops, right? Because usually you gotta come back into the shop before it opens. So you're getting out there for like two, two and a half hours real quick, and either you're coming in with a couple. And what's cool though is like some days I'll, I'll I'll open up the shop and Rob's coming in off the boat and they've got the bags. I'm like, I had a great morning, you know, like they're really good. They, you know, so last year we were pretty consistent. We caught and all those little, you know, short before work trips, we were catching 15 fish. Yeah. And, you know, we were strictly targeting Kings and most of the time we were getting seven, especially seven or eight Kings out of that 15 fish. And, Especially in like late July, you know, Salmonorama to like middle of July all the way until August. I mean, it was there were a lot of kings yeah. out there. Yeah, uh, I remember that one trip we went. Um, Nick came with us. Um, yeah, it was me, you, Nick, and Phil. That was a really good day because we did caught, and I think we were out there a little longer than normal. But yeah, I was I was uh, hauling back in to get here in time. That's for sure. <laughs> but yeah, I think we had our limit that day. We had, I mean, a mixed bag of everything. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was, it was it was pretty good. I don't think we had any big fish that day, yeah, like decent sized fish, but nothing big. No, but it, it would like it's to the combo right, which is great, where you can go out and you just have a nice trickle every so many minutes or so. There's just another rod firing off, and then uh, and then kind of just keeping the pacing going. Um, if you if you got your lines in the water, what's your what's your approach to frequency of changing stuff? Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> that's why we're here. It's a podcast. Um, <laughs> it, it all depends on what I think is going on. Do I think I'm in the fish or do I think I'm just fishing where there's no fish? It, do I think that it's just they've shut down? Um, if I think I'm in the fish, if I'm marking fish in my graph and I think I'm, I got a right speed and angle, I mean, I'll, I'll tell my first mate, I'll put a line of spoons in the back. I say, I want these changed. That rod changed every 10 minutes if it does not catch a fish. Now, if I'm in the fish and I just think it's speed or angle, I mean, I'll let a lure soak. I mean, I have my, my, my big, like, 400 copper, pretty much a mag RV moonshine wonderbed lives on it. Mm. I mean, the only reason it gets changed is when it breaks off. That's, I mean, but at the same time, I have rods where I'll change seven, eight, ten times a trip if I think that it's the lure. So it's, it's really reading the water and reading what's going on. So you, the last thing you want to do, and I've, I've preached this a lot, is, you know, you just start changing a lure over and over and over again. And all of a sudden, you finally get into the fish, and you've got a lure from 1952 on your line that hasn't caught a fish in 30 years. And you just you got junk on all your lines now, and you're actually in the fish, and you're not going to catch anything because you, you've taken all your good go-to lures off that work for you because you <laughs> think that it was a lure, and it's not. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, we go through a selection of lures, and all of a sudden, I'm like, you know what? Put this back out and it's the first lure we had on and it's like magic that's just it like goes it, off and it goes off and it's it was your angle your speed or you just weren't in the right place yet you know it's it's reading that so yeah what about for you blake uh i'm gonna play with my angle and my speed before i start changing stuff you know i'm gonna turn 10 degrees this way 10 degrees this way you know and just try to get the speed and angle figured out and then after that i'm gonna start changing stuff because usually when I go out, I got everything I have confidence in from the mm -hmm. last day or whatever, right. you know. So a lot of times you can pick that angle or speed, and it'll start producing before you start changing stuff. Because like Caleb said, you put something out just random that you have no confidence in, and then all of a sudden you get the right angle. Now you're really not going to catch anything. I would say that's probably when, you know, when I talk to Blake or I talk to the other captains I talk to, the first two questions are what's your angle, what's your speed. I would say before... I ask what's on that rod because a lot of times, like, when he's running, I don't care what I do, it ain't gonna work for me. <laughs> like, I, I gotta, you know, I gotta figure out, like, you know, there are fish here, obviously, if somebody's catching them. And a lot of times it can be literally a 10 degree course change and it makes all the difference in the world or a little speed difference and it makes all the difference in the world. That is important. It, it, that's a recurring theme that uh, hopefully for those of you that have been watching the podcast have heard uh, extensively from all the various guests we've had, which is angle and speed. Hands down, before what lure you're pulling and what, what this is, what that, it's angle and speed, and then dialing things in from there. 
because you guys make a great point. Um, we all have our confidence lures, uh, things that we're, you know, used to run in, it's produced. And so a lot of times it is just kind of tweaking out your, your how you're presenting it to the fish, which is speed and angle. You know, you got to factor in your currents and uh, all these kinds of things to get it to them in the right way that they want, that they're going to take it. Whether, you know, one of those two things factor into to uh, uh, to any of that. So I, I do want to take a moment here to mention, because we're going to have this podcast up before we actually do this event, but we are going to have both of you guys here. Um, and let's talk about that quickly uh, so folks know that they can come, hear you guys talk. We're going to do a little something different with you guys. Um, it's It's... Technically, I guess you can call it a seminar, but it's not quite a seminar. I think we've kind of called it like a captain's Q and A. Yeah, it's kind of like a get together, if you want to call it that, and more just yeah. asking each other questions. Yeah, and it's people ask us informal, questions. right? That's why I want right. to say it's a seminar because seminar the expectation is you come, you listen, and someone talks to you. But this is going to be more of like a dialogue where uh, both of you are going to be up here, and you want to explain a little bit more. Yeah, so we're going to have a PowerPoint and everything, but at the same time, we want you guys to be interactive with us. And me and Blake are going to go back and forth because just because I do it one way doesn't mean, as we've discussed today, doesn't mean it's the right way. Blake's way is the right way too. I mean, there's multiple ways to do things where you know your boat's going to fish differently. Blake and I both have big charter boats, but our boats fish very differently. So we're going to be able to you know go back and forth and say what works for me might work for you guys. You know, coming to listen to us talk. Or what Blake says might work for you. It'll just be a great kind of back and forth um, discussion on different ways to do it. And you guys can figure out what works the best for you. Let me ask you this, right? Because you guys do have uh, big charter boats. And um, let me pose you this question. If I'm a small boat guy, what, what what's the benefit to uh, for me to come hear you talk about fishing when you're fishing out of a vastly different vessel than I am? What would you say to those guys? Um, the, how they benefit we just, we have a lot of experience. We're out there 200 times a year, you know, or 210 times a year or something like that. So it's just, it's more learning, you know, how we set our spreads up, what we run, what we're going to start with, you know, what lines, coppers, lead cores, yellow birds, what time of year we're going to run that stuff, wire dipsies, you know, things like that. And I think a lot of new, new people to this, especially with small boats, get really nervous. Like, oh, I can only run, you know, three or four rods comfortably. I mean... I've been on a 17-foot tracker and ran, you know, with four of us in the boat, you know, 12 rods, no problem. You get a, I mean, you can run 15, you know, if you, if you have the people, you can run 15, 18 rods on a small boat, no problem. It's all about just learning how to manage it, where to put the things so they don't end up together. Yeah. But, um, you know, I used to fish on a small boat. I've had a decent amount of experience with it. I mean, to this day, I still go out with some buddies that have smaller boats. You know, just because we have a bigger boat, the only difference is a small boat will catch more fish shallow. I would say most of the time a small boat is going to outfish any big charter boat in shallow. They're quieter, they're stealthier. I think it's just a whole better setup for it. So if anything, you guys with the small boats, you know, you know, have a, a, a gain over us. So yeah. And then as for offshore fishing, the only benefit for us is we can go out in rougher water. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, really, I mean, I would say there is just as much opportunity for a small boat to catch exactly what we catch. You know, with the right experience and you know knowing where to be so yeah so that's gonna be the great thing about them uh the date and the time let's give them all that information while while, while we're talking about it as well uh it's um the first saturday of march which i believe is march 4th and yep. i think we're gonna start things uh, up at uh, 9 a.m i believe and this is free it is free yes yep. so i mean if you got nothing else go, going on uh stop by the shop on uh, march 4th 9 a.m and uh, you can hear both of them talk about this in like this captain's Q&A. And, and again, it's going to be the idea is for it to be very interactive. So if you're here, you can ask questions and it'll just be a big group convo. We're going to have a really nice raffle, too. We'll, I'll, I'll be raffling off a bunch of Moonshine products. I think Blake's got uh, some Magna Metal stuff coming to raffle off and we'll be raffling off a teaching charter as well. Some unreleased Magna Metal stuff. Ooh. Oh, is that really? New stuff, huh? New I'm, products? Maybe I'll magically win. <laughs> <laughs> I might enter the raffle. Rigged. I don't have a boat and I'll enter the raffle. <laughs> and then I'll sell it on eBay. Well, they're kind of released, but they're not on the website yet. Okay, okay. So, um, oh, what was I going to ask about that? Uh, you said, um, oh, man. I think was... Rob will have stubbies, too. I think so. I stubbies think might be by then. about a week and a half out from getting that order. I'm not exactly sure. But we'll think they came to listen to us. They just came to buy all the stubbies. <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> 
we'll have all the stubbies in this room, so they have to come <laughs> so in they here have to, to come get them. In, and they have to listen to the whole presentation before they're eligible to buy one. Yes. yes. Don't worry, guys. We're going to make sure that, that, that uh, folks stay here for your presentation. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a, a great time. A, a lot of information um, it will be exchanged. So make sure you guys come here for that. Make sure you, you know about that as well. Uh, what, what else is there to uh, What else can we talk about as far as uh, this year? Let me. I'm trying to think of Rob. Anything come to mind? I'm trying to remember. It seems so long ago. As far as the yeah. mission, um, I'm ready to get out. I know that. I, I finally got the itch to get back out now. Like I'm really like all right, yeah. cold. I'm. Let's speed it up here. Ready to get back out in the water. When when do you guys? Uh, when does your, when does the season start for you? Uh, like mid to late April, I would say. I'll be firing up the first day of first first day of April is my first. When Caleb's always the first in the harbor. No, no, first in the water. No, no, usually first to fish out of North Point. Not, there's usually a few other boats in before I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't leave the dock. <laughs> Are you guys replacing your line every year, or you just wait till it starts breaking? Um, so monofilament I change, you actually use your pie multiple times a year just because you use it so much and the sun beats on it and I'll at least strip some off and put some new fresh on it. But usually the mono gets changed every year. Um, braid and lead, usually you can start to tell like when it starts getting faded and kind of starts looking rougher, it's starting to lose its strength. But I use like all my backing is 65 pound braid. That way, if it loses a little strength over the years, it's still, you know, strong. I feel like if you use, and most reels you buy for lead or copper are big enough to where you can put it. plenty of backing on there if you need to strip some off. And or hold the heavier pound test to where if you need to, you know, lose either lose some strength or you need to strip some, either one, it's, you know, you still have a strong line. You start with like 30, I feel like you lose a little bit and now you're getting the danger zone really fast. What are those things that uh, get you excited about getting out in the water? Probably finally getting paid again. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is always a perk. Um, I, I enjoy the challenge of like figuring the fish out and like nothing's like more exciting when like, you go to the back of your boat and you grab a lure set up and something a little different that you've been wanting to try and you put it down, you turn around, look up at your graph or in front of your boat and you turn back and there's a fish on it. And you're like, oh, I do kind of know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> like you feel good about it. Like That's so true, I, though, yeah. I enjoy that feeling a lot or like coming to the shop and trying something new out or whatever. And, you know, a lot of us can get stuck in our ways. I mean, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm very guilty of that. Like my first mate will be like, oh, Kiel, let's try this. And I'll be like, no, it's stupid. <laughs> As the Rob says, well, I mean, listen, I mean, you know how many times I've sat here where I'm like, oh, Rob, you know what would be great to try this with this? And he's like, yeah, that's stupid. Just put on a bullfrog. Why? Why? <laughs> bullfrog or super frog. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. A, call it a day. Don't ever go to Rob for, for a thought about, hey, Rob, I have this idea to try this differently. We're like, well, let me run this big squid behind this stubby and I'm going to put a spinning glow in front of the squid. And then. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I didn't try that. I put the squid on though. The squid, squid <laughs> guys. I can confirm. Squid still pull pull fish. I have a clearance bin full of squids. <laughs> yes, a dollar. <laughs> so they stock up. Forget the flies. Get the squids. We're gonna squids are making. Hey, they, a they last comeback. longer than a fly for they sure. Do. They do. They, they do. Way more durable. Yep. They get, get the white one. The pink one will work well. And there's there's a little bonus. Not watch all year. Everyone's got squids on their lines. It'd be great. I uh, mean, there was a time. Yeah. They well, they, but they still use them in the West Coast religiously. Yeah. Like they catch all those salmon out there using the little hooches, and and they work. I mean, just the tackle they use in you know Sturgeon Bay compared to here is like just I mean, the spreads are totally different. Oh, yeah, even mm -hmm. like Milwaukee from here. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's you know. That's an interesting one. What 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 is it? Uh, what's different about what they're doing? I don't know. When I fish out of Sturgeon Bay, it's like almost. I mean, there's so many for flashers and flies. I mean, just the color of flies they use is different. The color of the spoons they use is different. I mean. It's just, it's a total different, I mean, they have a total different fishery than we do. I mean, same thing with like steel dodgers, like size zero lure Jensen's that aren't made anymore. I mean, it's from like, I don't know, Chicago to Milwaukee is where they're used. And like, that's, I mean, they mm -hmm. don't use them anywhere else. It's not a thing. I mean, we use them a ton here for big cohos in the summer, lake trout. I mean, they're a great weapon in our arsenals, but like, it's not a thing. Or like in our area, lake. we see... Like with Stinger, the regular Stinger size spoon is the dominant spoon. Whereas in most of the other areas, it's Stingray size. Everybody wants Stingrays. The they don't ones. really use the little ones that yeah, we use. Yeah, and your selection of Stingrays is like this big. And then if you got this massive selection of mm -hmm. regular size Stingers that are just, you know, that's what we buy. I mean, I mean, I have, you know, same thing for ma for Moonshines. I prefer the regular size Moonshine compared to a Magnum. And I mean, I've got two boxes of full of open regular size Moonshines. And then... My little magnum box get opened, you know, gets opened half the time of the others. Is there is there a certain time or situation that you 
uh, prefer one over the, over the other? I like Magnums in the morning. Okay. I think they're. I think that it's just a little bigger flash. I think the fish are hungrier, so usually my Magnums are out in the in the morning for the most part, except for the RV Moonshine Wonder Red Magnums. It's always at the four hundred. It's always there. Uh, how about for you, Blake? Uh, I like the Magnums when the lake trout are suspended. You know, I'll run okay. the Magnums on my riggers. Sometimes I'll throw them on a dipsy even. Um, but yeah, it seems like I catch a lot of suspended lake trout on the Magnums. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, time of year, is there, is there a time of year preference? Meaning this time of year, I like to run them a little bit more than other times of the year at all, or not really? Uh, I would say like end of July through August, mm -hmm. into September, you know, when the lake trout are really around. That's where we're in the big ones? Yeah. Same. Same thing for me. I mean, I, I, I don't really use, I'm not big into the magnets for the lake trout. I just use them for usually king fishing in the morning. And I, I'll run them. I've caught lake trout on them, but at the same time, I've caught them on the other side spoons too. So Actually, I probably run magnums more than standards when I think about it. But again, we're always looking for kings. So we'll put a few of each out there. Um, kind of let the fish tell us. But I, I think uh, like two years ago, we were almost always running a magnum on our SWR. And last year, it turned out like the standard was better for us. But we were running magnums on our, on our long lines, the coppers and lead cores. And those were pretty good for us whereas the year before i think um actually i think it was the same we were running magnums but again we're always targeting kings we're not trying to catch anything smaller yeah but that plays a big part of it for sure yeah i would uh, yeah definitely i mean a spread for kings this can be totally i mean we're literally putting out like all right this rod has a better chance of catching cohos but it probably will catch other things too this rod is specifically like target steelhead but it will still catch other things too <laughs> like that th that statement needs to be we'll still catch other things too yeah. Because we need, you know, we're trying to fill a box of, you know, keep things exciting for, you know, six, eight hours, you know, constantly like, you know, not have lulls and where you're always having something going on. Yeah. And then, you know, what I find like as we get later into the morning, if I'm out there later in the morning, that's when on my long lines, I'll start switching out to the stingers. What does your normal spread look like? We'll, we'll just kind of say your two riggers, your, your two dipsies and like say two boards. What, what are those looking like in terms of what's on those lines? Um... So my wires, my if it's like a summer spread, my wires are usually flasher flies. I mean, they're sure. like the main thing where they are 95% of the time a flasher fly. They're already a very aggressive presentation, so I just leave them aggressive most of the time. First thing in the morning, usually one's got like a white hot spot and a bullfrog on it. The other one's probably got a dragon slayer or a dragon lady with, you know, a holly green crinkle or a green monster or something. And then uh, my downriggers are usually... They'll, you one will start with a flasher in the morning and then it'll switch to a spoon, like either a light line with a spoon or, you know, just a slider rig with a spoon. And then the other one's usually an SWR with a spoon on it. And then my boards are usually spoons too. So a lot, lot, lot more spoons. I, I, I'm big on spoon fishing. I like spoon fishing. Is that, is um, that just a, it, because of the variety of fish you'll catch in numbers? Yeah. It, it, you know, you'll catch, you know, fish that are really active, fish that are, you know, not as active. You'll catch more like negative kings and stuff on that stuff as well. Um, multiple species good for different times of the day whereas a flasher a lot of times after you know that first light a lot of times your flash you'll, you'll start with your divers being your best rods for like an hour and a half and all of a sudden you can't buy a bite on them so you know I, that's why i run a lot of spoons so got you like what's your what's your setup two uh, riggers two divers two boards kind of depends on the conditions you know if, if it's rough out i like a lot of spin doctors <laughs> Cause they're a little bit more speed friendly, you know, you can go faster or slower with them, but on a day to day basis, I would say both the riggers are going to have flasher flies on them. Both the wire dipsies are going to have flasher flies on them and then one spoon and then a stubby on the long line for summertime. Nice little diversity. And that covers, it, it gives you like the diversity of, of uh, fish catches. I mean, yeah, more, I like flasher flies more than spoons in my opinion, but that's cause I troll slow. You know. Yep, and I troll faster. So that's that's one of the things we're going to be talking about. Is just, I mean, we, we literally just set our six rod spread and vastly different, vastly different yeah. spreads. But at the same time, we catch a very similar amount of fish a lot of the days, where it's just literally the difference is speed. Yeah. I mean, I would say there's really no days where he smokes me. You know, everybody has yeah. their days, but usually we're within three to five fish of each other. You know, because we're always talking and seeing what's going on. Yeah. Now, how, how does it work? Um, when you mentioned that, right? Like you, within three to five fish of each other. Do you, do you guys tend to have a little uh, friendly like banter going on? Like, haha, you know? No, I mean, I would say we always try to help each other out because there is times, you know, where I might call him and he's like, "Yeah, I got twelve, and I haven't had a bite yet." 
you know, so it's going to, he's going to help me out. Same thing. There's times he'll call me and it's, I got 12 and he's got nothing yet, you know, so we try to help each other out because we're both there to make a living. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Nobody wants, the big thing is nobody wants to come back to the dock looking like a complete <laughs> idiot. <laughs> and I mean, if him catching 12 fish and me catching, you know, one fish is not going to benefit his business greatly. I mean, I mean, the best thing to happen is for people to be going home with, with their friends, from their charters, and saying, man, Lake Michigan is awesome. That is, the, that is what we all strive for, is, you know, everybody to be coming to have a good time because it just brings more business into the marina and for everybody around the lake. I mean, him catching, you know, me smoking Blake does nothing for me. I mean, you know, it's, I'm not, that's not my goal. Maybe for like an hour you yeah, brag about ha, it. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it may look more like you're breaking his, you know, breaking his uh, chops, you know, yeah, a little bit. You know, you know for like an dock. hour and then yeah. after that it's like, okay. Yeah, I mean. But you're still trying to help each other. Yeah, yeah 100%. Know, sure. In this. sure. Uh, you know, you touched on about uh, the benefit for this, right, where, where you want people to leave here and say, man, this is such a great salmon fishery. Uh, I, I I actually think it might, it's probably currently the it is I think the argument can be made the best salmon fishery in terms of consistency numbers of fish uh, your limits of fish when you look at anywhere else in the continental U S uh, to go for salmon uh, I mean where are some other you can go out in the Pacific Northwest you can go in the West uh, you can you can get salmon on the East Coast right. So no, they're, no, they're not really. I mean, we're pretty so. spoiled rotten here. Yeah, you really yeah. are. It's a, and it's an incredibly underrated and yeah. just underutilized fishery, you know, compared to there's nothing else around here, around here where you can catch these fish. No, um, there's nowhere else you can go and catch and keep as many as we do. Yeah, you know, or we we can catch our five fish limit per person anytime we want, and that's pretty consistent. That doesn't really happen anywhere, and you're totally legal to keep those fish. You know, that's one thing I said. Uh, you know. I, Especially after having fished out in the, in the Pacific Northwest and, and see the challenges they have there with their numbers and the seasons can just abruptly close and uh, one rod in the water, just very challenging. I said to myself, it's like, man, you know, if, if I ran a charter boat here, I, I mean, you guys should be running targeted ads to the people out in these different regions and be like, come here. You, you can catch all these. No, now, it is amazing. We get we get we get groups that have fished other places and they're like, well, really, we can. We can catch five a person. And you're right. like, yeah. yeah you like, get some people that are like, I thought we could only catch one. You know, that? I thought we were gone. <laughs> yeah. 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 You <laughs> should have just ran with that. It's, yeah, like, right, right, it's a one hour trip today. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we, we, we certainly, Lake Michigan as a whole, just uh, fa fantastic for, for salmon and trout. Um, and even going further, just our area, it's such a unique place within the entire, you know, lake. Uh, Especially when you when we talk about some of the other like the other side of the lake on the Michigan side, we hear stories about how they're either there or they're not, or even f further up north of us in like Sturge Bay or north of Milwaukee, how it can they're either there or they're not, depending on what's going on. Yet here, there's always something. You know, there's always something around. There's usually a fallback plan, which is really really convenient. Lakers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not even that. I mean, there's been falls where we've, you know, I've ran a Kenosha and fished browns. I mean, even, or, you know, I mean, or, you know, I know everybody hates it. And I hope I don't get like, you know, you know, destroyed for this. But, you know, sometimes <laughs> you, sometimes you got to go to the hill and you find the little one-year-old, two-year-old kids. Oh, oh, I mean, uh, that, is, that is quite controversial, which is the, uh, the fishing of the juvenile king. Destroying the future. Hey. <laughs> It's a last ditch effort. <laughs> Wiping out the kindergartners. <laughs> <laughs> That's so terrible when you say it like that. But I mean, there's usually a fallback plan. I mean, you, you know, nobody wants to go do that. I mean, it's, it's a last ditch effort. There's, you know, you've been out to 250 and you still can't catch a lake trout and a steelhead. And, you know, there's usually that. There's usually, there's, but there's usually trout and steelhead way offshore. You know, there's there's a steel, like, kings disappear and all of a sudden we have steelhead. Yeah. It's, steelhead move on, all of a sudden cohos are back. You know, it's just, the way it works here we always have something to catch and it's not too often that you really have to resort to Killing fishing in a nursery you know yeah. like like there's always something yeah, yeah just go out a little deeper you'll find some other fish to catch yeah. really um which is it's pretty cool and it's not like that everywhere no i i, mean, I, I the more i fish this this area I, I i tend to look and i'll look at the map and i'm like what is it about just this location if you look between you know let's say uh I mean, honestly, uh, what, let's say 
Would you say from the bottom of the lake to up here, or would you say maybe Chicago to to, to like as Racine? far as just like consistent area? Yeah. I wouldn't even. I'd say I would say like Waukegan, Waukegan to, to Racine. Racine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The consistency is just yeah. And, and I always look. I'm like, what is it about just this geo geographic location uh, on the lake that just is conducive to this uh, transition of fish that are just there's always something around. You know, maybe is it uh, because of the hills? Is it because of um, there are kind of various um, things along the shoreline. Like there were some plants here. Some are active. Some aren't. You know, whatever. Well, it may I think be. you've got. You know, you've got two rivers to the north. You've got the root in the Milwaukee and the lake. Typically, kind of the current of the lake is generally going from north to south. So that helped. That's one thing. Racine's got a lot of structure, and then on the south end of it, Waukegan has a lot of structure, and we're kind of like right in the middle of it. You know, I mean, we have a fair amount of the mesa stuff yeah. like that. You know, so I think we just have a lot of structure to keep them here. Mm -hmm. Also, I think my understanding and. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but the southern basin of the lake has much more nutrients in it. It's yep. shallower, it stays warmer. So just starting from the bottom of the food the bottom of the food chain and up, there's more nutrients for every single fish. So and like where we are, North Point, Kenosha, we have the fast we have fast enough access to the deep water. We're still the south basin of the lake, it's still shallower than the northern end of the lake, and there's more nutrients, but still deep enough water where they can find cool water and a place where they want to live. Mm-hmm. That's actually it. All adds into it. No, that that on paper it makes sense, right? Like it, it all it seems very, very plausible and reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, down south, you've especially uh, in Indiana and southern Chicago, you've got all of those. Uh, they're not factories. They're like the mills, the steel plants, mm -hmm. and all these things that are. There's quite a few areas that you have um, water intakes, and then they kick out, you know, warm water discharges and all that stuff, which is. You know, fish obviously gravitate to all of that. So you got quite a few different rivers down there as well that uh, feed in and all that. So they got a good, like I think we said, like a nursery uh, ecosystem down there, conducive yeah. to you know, uh, young of the year fry and and all that stuff. And then, as we know, they start traveling north, and then here we are with them, and it's a really good spot. So uh, for any of you that are not by chance uh, in the area. Maybe you're in a different part of Lake Michigan or you're somewhere else outside of the area. Great opportunity to come in and, and experience the uh, salmon and trout fishery. Definitely world-class trout here. You, you, I mean, we've seen guys all through the ice pulling some hogs this, this winter mm -hmm. for the short amount of time that ice has been there. But <laughs> yep. they managed to pull some stuff. on. We saw a couple of videos of um, – uh, I, I think I saw a video on Instagram from Big Boy. Uh, they're on the river – it's ice, and there's, like, one little open <laughs> hole. He pitches in there, and they pull a big brown out of it. Like, it's pretty funny, but uh, you you have a legitimate shot at a 20-pound world-class brown shot. I mean, where else can you get browns that big? Yeah. Uh, not many it's places. very few places in the world, really. Yeah, yeah. very few. So that that's the uh, the cool thing about about this fishery. There's just such a variety of things you can do and, and go out. And, and that's only just us talking about salmon and trout. I mean, you still got perch. Perch fishing has been, I've been keeping an eye on all the guys doing perch fishing this year. It's been good numbers. You know, we're not seeing like a ton of jumbos, but like guys are putting in nine, 10 inches, eater size. Mm -hmm. um, and keeping an eye on that. It looks pretty good. Last couple of years, the perch fishing has been pretty, what I would say consistent amongst those those guys that are uh, fishing it. Um, and I mean, we've seen guys right now for the pike in the harbors. Oh, yeah. There's, there's been, yeah. There's there's been some, some really good-sized pike caught this year. Really, yeah. there's some monster pike being pulled out, which is super cool to see in these harbors that um, that are thriving, you know, absolutely thriving. And then, of course, smallmouth. So, like, you've got so many options uh, to fish, uh, and especially if you are a small boat, that that's one thing I think we don't even touch on enough, which may be something we, we need to kind of incorporate in, 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 in some of our future content, but is talking about um, for small boats, when you plan to go out and having to call an audible, meaning if you were going to go out and you get to the ramp and the weather completely changes, it's like, oh, well, I really can't go out far or whatever. What, what other options? And, and like, Say the situation is the weather's a little rough for the boat. You really can't go out to where the salmon are because they're out deep at that point. Well, instead of me just going home and wasting the day, what else can I do on the lake? There's other things you can fish for, whether it's in the harbor for smallies or pike or, you know, maybe there's perch nearby or something. like. So I think that's something we should definitely, like, talk, on, talk about in a future uh, 
uh, a- episode and and maybe uh, I don't get the we have to pull in some folks that target them specifically. Yep. You know, get them on here. Uh, but uh, yeah, so listen, um, great conversation with you guys. Uh, thank you for sharing all information that you that you do because uh, a lot of people find it very valuable and insightful which you guys can get more of when they're here on March 4th, 9 a.m. at the shop. Absolutely free. Come on by. Uh, we, we may have stubbies in by then, which is really the real draw. All right, guys. Just, all right. Just, just, you know, sit here for like five minutes, make them feel good, and you come get your stubby and leave. Um, <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Um, but I'd, I'd be admiss if I didn't say if, for you guys to go ahead and let folks know where they can reach you to get the trip in because these are – uh, just two of the many great captains that are here in our area that uh, um, will get you on the fish. Uh, I, I know, I know, uh, Caleb. I think you also offer, or at least if someone's interested in, more of like a teaching trip, right? Yeah. So, so like, we, can you explain what that is versus what a normal trip is? So, I mean, instead of just the normal, normal trip where we go out, my first mate and I said everything. We can sit there with you. You can set rides. We can everything we put in the water. We're gonna tell you why we're doing it, what we're thinking, why I started where I started. Um, all that. Uh, and on top of that, on our seminar on March 4th, we're going to be raffling off a teaching charter, Blake and I, which will be the two of us on the boat with you and really get the, we'll really confuse you. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's like, yeah. I'll just go it's going to be hard to get one side of the boat to fish. We'll just, ask the other no, we'll, just go in <laughs> circles. we'll just go in circles. The inside will be nice and slow for Blake and the outside will be nice and fast for me. But no, we'll, we're going to do it together. So it'll be a great opportunity if uh, whoever wins that raffle. Yeah, that's, that's, that's huge that is very very huge um blake do you do any uh educational stuff or you mostly just focus on uh, uh i would say like every charter i kind of do that okay. you know i explain to people why i'm running this or how to use this you know why i'm fishing where i'm fishing stuff like that and what we're targeting trying to target you know yeah. i just try to let the customers know what we're doing and why we're doing it you know, you know every every group is different i'm sure you do the same thing but when groups will get on the boat and i'll be like you can do as much as you want exactly. or as little as you want right. like this is your trip I just tell them if you want to set stuff, net fish, do it. You know, just don't break anything or drop yeah. anything overboard. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine the client's going to net a fish and just the whole net just flies into the water. Oh, it's so I've old. seen it. Yeah, I've seen it firsthand. It's very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> but then that way, you know, if they knock it off with the net, something yeah. it's on them. Yeah. You know, and it's their trip; they can do what they want. Uh-huh. Yeah. As long as they're not wrecking the boat and dropping stuff in the lake and <laughs> all, all that. So, uh, cool. So, Blake, let them know where they can reach you at and uh, to get on a trip. Uh, you can reach me at stormforcesportfishing.com. Uh, text me or call me at 224-730-4105 or email me at K at gmail.com. Caleb? Uh, you can reach me at migratorcharters.com, uh, Facebook Migrator Charters, uh, or call or text 224-234-3704. Um, or you can email us at fishing.migrator at gmail.com. There it is, guys. So thank you to both Catherine for being here for, uh, with us for this episode of the LMA podcast. Uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Take care, and uh, we'll be out in the water soon enough. It's coming up soon, man. Later, guys. Right. Thank you.